Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be speaking at the closing dialogue of the Asia Future Summit. It's brought together diverse perspectives on the themes of geopolitics, the economy, societal shifts, technological breakthroughs. And I commend SPH Media and, its partic and the participants for the wide-ranging and lively discussions. Asia remains a vibrant region with great promise. It's home to more than half the world's people, including a growing, increasingly well-educated and affluent middle class. And Asia's GDP is likely to exceed that of the rest of the world combined in the near future. The two Asian giants, China and India, continue to make steady economic progress. China's growth has slowed lately, and its population is gradually aging, but is still expected to expand at 45 to 5.5% annually, and will continue to be a major growth engine with its large and growing consumer market, its increasingly skilled workforce, and rapid technological development. India is now the most populous nation in the world, and one of the fastest growing economies, recording 6 to 7 percent annual growth. If it can keep this up, its young and energetic workforce and its strength in the digital economy and technological innovation will continue to push it forward. India has just delivered a successful G20 presidency, and it's aspiring to play a more active role beyond the subcontinent. Southeast Asia is emerging as an economic center in its own right, as a region that's young, fast-growing, urbanizing, digitalizing. It's home to many high-growth companies and even unicorns. And the combined GDP of Southeast Asian countries of over three trillion US dollars makes it collectively the fifth largest economy in the world and it's projected to become the fourth largest by the end of the decade. But to realize Asia's promise, we need the right conditions in the world. For the last few decades, Asia has been fortunate to enjoy a peaceful, stable, and increasingly globalized environment. And this global and regional stability has been critical to the region's dynamism and prosperity. We hope that the decades ahead will see peace prevailing and economic progress continuing in Asia, but this is far from guaranteed. The future depends on the choices that we make. For a start, we need to uphold and reinforce the open and inclusive regional architecture. Many Asian countries recognize the importance of all the major powers having stakes in and contributing to the region's stability and development. And hence, ASEAN, the Southeast Asian countries, has long sought to build a dense web of cooperation and interdependence and having overlapping circles of friends. For example, we've enunciated an ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, AYP, that provides a framework for omnidirectional, inclusive cooperation with ASEAN's partners. Next, we need to deepen regional economic integration. For example, we've created the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, in Asia. It's the world's largest FTA, 30% of the population, 30% of the GDP of the world. And despite the trend against globalization, the RCEP was ratified by enough countries to enter into force last year. I think nearly everybody has ratified it. We also have other economic cooperation mechanisms, like the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, the CPTPP, the Belt and Road Initiative, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for, pros for Prosperity, and many others. So the mechanisms for cooperation are being built, the 
people are joining it. And there are also new sectors which hold promise, for example, in the digital and the green economies. So this, that's the second precondition, that countries need to work together to integrate the region. The third precondition is that individual countries need to manage our own internal social and political developments to create stable societies and states that can contribute to the prosperity of Asia and that have governments with a mandate to pursue regional cooperation. Myanmar is an example of how domestic troubles can hold back regional cooperation and export difficulties to a country's neighbors. But for every country, domestic stability is a precondition for effective external collaboration and domestic political function, not dysfunction, is equally necessary. International relations are vital to the security and prosperity of a country, but the country's foreign policy always depends on supportive domestic politics. It's in every country's interest to cooperate for win-win outcomes, but we also need to be realistic about the difficulties of achieving this in a turbulent world. And in my view, Asia faces three broad challenges. The first is increasing geopolitical contestation, particularly between the US and China. You've talked about that a lot these last two days. It's a rivalry that affects every country and region in the world. I believe neither the US nor China seeks conflict, but the issues that divide them are deep. And increasingly, each sees the other as an adversary. And the risk of accident or miscalculation is ever present, especially in dangerous hotspots like the Taiwan Strait. And this worries Asian countries a lot. We are close to ground zero. We'll be impacted economically too. De-risking is understandable, but de-risking is risky and costly. It may result in bifurcation, and it will likely have more than just economic consequences. But the picture is not all gloomy, because while different countries will align more closely with one side or the other, nearly all still want to be friends with both. And third countries will pursue policies that maximize their freedom of action, and hence they will work hard to keep regional cooperation going and also to keep the region open, to prevent it from becoming a closed block in rivalry with blocks in other parts of the world. It will be a more complex region, no doubt, but it is not likely to be a region split between two camps. Secondly, within regionally, within Asia, we have our fair share of difficult issues to deal with. We all wish to cooperate, win-win, mutually accommodating, peacefully, and with a greater good of the greater number at heart, but doing it is not so simple. Sometimes between two countries, there will be difficult issues, like the dispute over the Tiawi or Senkaku Islands between China and Japan. Sometimes it will involve more parties, like the South China Sea, where maritime claims of several ASEAN countries and China overlap. Even between ASEAN members, while relations are generally good, there exist some difficult bilateral issues, for example, border issues or maritime disputes, which will be politically and practically difficult to resolve. So Asian countries need to insulate their overall relations from these specific difficulties build mutual trust, and to continue to cooperate pragmatically for mutual benefit. It's happening to some extent. For example, Japan and Korea are working hard to put their historical differences between them. Or China and Australia, who do not see eye to eye on strategic issues, but they also have a deep economic relationship, and I'm happy to see their ties are currently improving. China has 
lifted tariffs on Australian barley exports, and I'm told have just recently removed barriers to Australian hay exports. So even countries that are not like-minded allies need to learn to cooperate and coexist with one another. The third challenge is the growing mood of nationalism and protectionism. Globalization is in retreat. Trade and investment flows are increasingly being organized not by economic logic, but by geopolitical orientation and national security imperatives. And countries are increasingly intervening in their economies to protect or subsidize industries and disregarding rules of international trade in the name of resilience and self-reliance. And inevitably, others respond in kind, which distorts markets, leads to escalating rounds of state support and protection, and leaves everyone worse off. It's a global trend, and it affects our region too. It happens to existing products when you're under pressure, food exports, for example, or mineral exports, because countries say, the rules no longer strictly apply. I hog what I have. I develop my downstream industries, whether or not it makes economic sense. Or green energy, where the rules have not yet been developed. But if we don't develop rules, I think we will be missing out on a great opportunity to cooperate to deal with climate change. So governments need to push against this to seek greater security and well-being collectively and not just individually. For Asia to realize its promise despite these difficulties, we all need to demonstrate a high standard of statesmanship and strong resolve to focus on shared interests. There are still many opportunities for win-win cooperation amongst Asian countries, and there are also global problems which cannot be tackled by countries at odds with one another. Climate change, pandemic preparedness, and not least, shared peace and prosperity. Asian countries have agency. If we can make the right choices, prioritizing cooperation, strengthening multilateralism, taking advantage of new opportunities, then we can create conditions for peace, security, and continued prosperity, even in this turbulent world. Speaking for Singapore, amidst this environment, internationally, it's all the more important for us to look to the future. We're preparing for leadership transition, preparing a new team to take Singapore forward into the next bound, and the younger leaders are developing a substantive national agenda in an extensive consultation exercise with the population under what we call Forward SG to build a more resilient and united Singapore. We are looking outward, working with our ASEAN and international partners, supporting deeper regional integration and multilateralism. We're doing all these so that we can set the right conditions and create opportunities for our next generation. Thank you very much.